The following program is a production of the Fairfax Network, Fairfax County Public Schools. You're watching Meet the Author with Chelsea Welcome to Meet the Author. I'm your host, Emily Godfrey. Joining me in the studio today is New York Times bestselling author, Chelsea Clinton. Welcome, Chelsea. Thank you so much, Emily. I'm happy to be here. Also joining us via Skype are students from Fair Hill Elementary School. Hello, Fair Hill. Hi, Hi guys. A few of Chelsea's book titles include She Persisted, 13 American Women Who Changed the World, don't Let Them Disappear, 12 Endangered Species Across the Globe, It's Your World, Get Informed, Get Inspired, and Get Going, and her most recent book, Start Now, You Can Make a Difference. Well, Chelsea, as a librarian and as a mom, I really appreciate the practical tips and the stories that you shared in Start Now. Oh, could you, thank you. Could you give us a little brief overview of what the book's about? Sure. So Start Now, in some ways, Emily, is the book uh, that I wish I would have had when I was your son's age. He's seven. Yes. Right? yes. He's so, a second grader. He's a second grader. So I had Mrs. Huey in second grade. Oh, nice. So shout out to Mrs. Huey if she's watching. <laughs> um, and I just had so many questions about the world, questions about kind of water and air, the environment but also kind of what was happening in my body, what I should be putting in my body or not putting in my body. And I really wish I would have had this book that kind of explained like what clean air is and what endangered species are, but also what I could do as a second grader or as a fourth grader to try to help there be more clean air and fewer endangered species in the world. So I really wrote this book uh, about issues that I was hearing from kids who are that age now that are really on their mind, on their heart and also to share the stories of some really terrific young change makers who are making a positive difference for their school, their community, or our world. It's really empowering to see, hear those stories because you really can do a lot. There's so many things that you can do. Oh my gosh, and there are things that you can do like around your own school. So I highlight a group of students who run a no idling campaign to try to help uh, educate their parents and the school bus drivers to not have their cars on while they're waiting for them to get out of school, that really you're gonna like decrease so much the carbon dioxide and then the pollution around your school if you difference. just turn your cars or the buses off. And then kind of people that are working to save orangutans on the other side of the world um, by trying to raise awareness about the dangers of palm oil. So there's so much you can do kind of in the world that you see every day and also just the world that you're aware of even if it's thousands and thousands of miles away. Well, we have some third grade students at Fairhill Elementary who have read Start Now, and they have some questions for you. Are you ready for them? I'm ready. Awesome. So who has the first question for Miss Clinton? Hi. Hi, what's your question? And please, and please tell me your name. Amir. Amir, and what's your question? Why did you write this book? So Amir, thank you for asking that question. I wrote this book uh, because I uh, talked to and really even more importantly listened to a lot of students your age, like third grade, some second graders, some fourth graders, even fifth graders about kind of big questions that were um, bothering them, motivating them to already try to make a positive difference, whether it was how to safely stand up to bullies in their school or help their community start a recycling program. So I wrote the book, uh, Amir, because I hope that it would be kind of relevant to students your age, um, really resonate uh, with students your age, so kind of feel like it was meaningful, and then hopefully inspire you to tackle issues that you care about, whether they're issues I write about and start now or other issues altogether. Awesome. Who has the next question? What is your name and what's your question? Preeti. Hi, what's your question? How, how, did, how did you come up with the title of this book? Wow, what a great Oh my one. gosh, you did. what a great question. Um, so I really have to give a lot of credit to my terrific editor, Jill Santopolo. So just like you have 
uh, teachers, librarians, kind of people in your life who hopefully help you become a better student, kind of hopefully improve kind of your writing over the course of the school year. That's the role that my editor plays for me. And so we just kept kind of talking about different titles. And I think I started with something like Action Now, and like there were just different <laughs> kind of ideas that were floating around. And we spent a lot of time together uh, to really come up with Start Now. Uh, you can make a difference because I did want it to be action oriented, but kind of Action Now just didn't sound nearly as strong as Start Now. Uh, so it definitely was a collaborative effort. And I'm really grateful uh, to my editor, Jill, for helping me uh, be a better writer, I think, over the many years that we've worked together and really helping me come up with a great title for this book. And it's awesome to hear, too, that writers need help. Oh, my gosh. You know, everybody needs help. Absolutely, we need help. And, you know, Jill has edited hundreds, thousands of books, probably. I've written seven now. So, you know, she just has so much more experience than I do, and I've learned so much with her and alongside her. So we are ready for our next question. Hi, what's your question? What inspired you to make a book with different chapters about completely different topics, like eating healthy and standing up to bullies? That's awesome. So although uh, there are different chapters, you're absolutely right. You know, like what does endangered species have to do with standing up to bullies? What they have to do with each other is what I really was hearing kind of students are uh, focused on, like what's really kind of motivating them, either because they're really upset about kind of what they're seeing in their schools around bullying or what they know is happening to endangered species like here in the United States or around the world, or they're really inspired by what people are doing already to stand up to bullies or to save tigers or whale sharks or pandas or pangolins or kind of all of the animals that desperately um, kind of need our help because we don't want them to disappear in our lifetime. So kind of what connects them are the things that I was hearing directly from uh, students just like you. So who has the next question for Ms. Clinton? Hi, what's your name? Dia. And what is your question? When did you first become interested in writing books? Wow. Oh, Dia. So yeah. I think I first became interested in writing books, you know, maybe in first grade. In first grade, I had Mrs. Mitchell. I'm still in touch <laughs> with her. So um, think about who your teachers are and the teachers you've already had at Fair Hill or wherever else you may have been in school because they still may be in your life 30 years later. So I'm still in touch with my first grade teacher, Mrs. Mitchell. And Mrs. Mitchell was so great because, well, for lots of reasons, but one of the reasons she was so great is she really uh, helped me discover my love of reading and then understanding that I didn't just have to kind of be a reader as a consumer of stories. I could be a reader and then help imagine my own stories. And then kind of that, I think, just spooled out like throughout my time in elementary school and then kind of all the way through high school and graduate school where I learned to love writing and kind of sharing stories, but also information that I think is important and that I hope kind of through my writing and storytelling, I can help others kind of recognize its importance. And I hope that it feels kind of um, relevant uh, to you, uh, Dia. And I hope that uh, maybe if you're as lucky to have great teachers as I did, and I'm sure you are at Fairhill, that you'll discover your passion, whether it's writing or something else altogether. So we, I think we have one more question right now from Fairhill Elementary School. Hi, what's your name and what is your question? Um, you won. You won. And my question is that what inspired you to make a specific um, chapter on endangered animals? So you and that's such a great question. I um, have always felt drawn to endangered animals and always felt a responsibility to endangered animals from the time I was your age or even younger. Um, I wrote a whole kind of other book just about endangered animals. Don't let them disappear. And I was so um, kind of grateful to know that kind of that passion that I felt when I was your age and I still feel now is something that is pretty widely shared um, among kids. When I um, was interviewing kids for my first um, book, It's Your World, and certainly also for Start Now, I just kept hearing kind of concerns about animals. Sometimes what was happening in the local animal shelter, sometimes what was happening in the kind of local ecosystem, um, and sometimes like what was happening to giraffes across the world or tigers around the world. So I just knew that I had to include 
a chapter on endangered animals, not just because it really mattered to me, but more importantly, because it seemed to really matter uh, to students like you, and I hope students including you. Well, thank you so much, Fairhill. Those are awesome questions. We will come back to you a, a little bit later in the show, okay? So we'll okay. see you soon. So do you have a question for Chelsea Clinton? Join the conversation. Jot down the information at the bottom of your screen. We welcome your calls and comments. So Chelsea, we also have some email questions that were sure. submitted earlier. So let's take a few of those now. This one is from Claremont Elementary School's second grade book group. And their question is, why are the topics you write about important to you? Well, they're important to me for a few reasons um, to the second graders. Some uh, because they're issues I've cared about my whole life. So truly, as long as I can remember issues around um, endangered species, yeah. around climate change, clean air, clean water, and issues that I've come to really recognize the importance of and care more just as I've gotten older. So issues really around health and vaccinations and things that particularly matter to me now as a mom and that I want yeah. my kids to understand and that I want all kids to understand why it is so important that we wash our hands after we go to the bathroom mm -hmm. or before we eat, why it is so important that we wash our hands if we have to go visit somebody in the hospital, why it's so important that we kind of get our vaccinations or if we get sick, we take every bit of the medicine right. our doctors have prescribed. So some of these issues I've cared about for a really long time and some I've cared about maybe not quite as long but care about just as intensely and I want young readers, whether they're my kid's age or your age, to care about them. And here's another email. This one is from Teddy at John Adams Elementary School. After reading Don't Let Them Disappear, he wants to know, how do we help animals right now? You gave some really good tips yes. at the end of the so, book. So, Teddy, it's a great question, and I would say it really depends on like what animal you're most drawn to. I mean, there are some things that we can do to try to help all animals, including ourselves. You know, fight climate change, absolutely be smarter about how we use energy, kind of water, ensuring that we're not using energy whenever we can afford not to. And then there are other things we can do to help specific animals. So if you're like me, Teddy, and you really love elephants. One of the things we need to do to help save elephants is educate people about the fact that ivory only comes from dead elephants. There's no safe way to, to extract, to extract ivory. Mm -hmm. And animal uh, elephants' tusks don't grow back. So even if you could somehow safely take off ivory, which you can't, but even if you could, you know, the elephant would still die because elephants who have tusks rely on their tusks to kind of access water, access the leaves and the food that they Eat. And so it's just always a bad idea to buy ivory. Ivory equals dead elephants. And one of the things we can do is to really help educate people about why they should never buy ivory or any um, parts that come from endangered species. Mm -hmm. And that may seem obvious, but a lot of people think that ivory or rhino horn grow back mm -hmm. um, or kind of often believe falsely, like if they see a tiger skin or a polar bear skin, it probably came from an already dead tiger or polar bear. We know that's not true. Or that true. there's some sort of luck involved. Totally, or, or yeah. yeah. So Lots you, of myths. So many myths. So just help educate, kind of, Teddy, the people in your life, it's like bad, bad, bad to ever buy ivory or tiger skins or rhino horns. It's not gonna do anything for you. It's only gonna hurt the animals. It's gonna hurt the planet. And it's going to kind of, lead to those animals disappearing when we really want those animals to be around forever. Forever, yeah. So Chelsea, we have a phone call from a student right now. Sure. Let's take that. Hello, caller, what is your name and what is your question for Ms. Clinton? Yes. Hi, caller, what's your name? Hi, my name is Jennifer. Hi, Jennifer, what's your question for Ms. Clinton? I have a question for her book, She Persisted. Did your mom inspire the book and did you think about including your mom? So Jennifer, awesome. that's such a great question. My mom uh, has always inspired me. Admittedly, that book though came out of a, a particular moment really inspired by Coretta Scott King and uh, Senator Elizabeth Warren. So a few years ago, um, Senator Warren from Massachusetts was trying to read a letter that Coretta Scott King had, had written um, years before. And um, she really thought it was relevant because it concerned uh, a man named Jeff Sessions who uh, at the time was being nominated to be our country's attorney general, so kind of the top kind of law enforcement officer in our country. And 
Uh, Coretta Scott King had written this letter uh, in 1986 about Jeff Sessions and his nomination at the time to be a judge. And in it, she painfully outlines his history of racism. And so Senator Warren thought this was a relevant letter. And I agree, because it concerned Jeff Sessions. And I also agree, because it was from Coretta Scott King, who was one of our country's great civil rights leaders. Who is she again? Do you so mind? I don't mind at all. And I'm so glad you asked, Emily, because so often Coretta Scott King is framed as um, just Dr. Martin Luther King Jr.'s widow. Um, and yet she was so much more than that. She was a civil rights leader already in her own right when they met. And when they got married, she continued her own work. After his tragic assassination, she carried on his legacy fighting for civil rights and women's rights. Um, and so she deserves kind of many of her own books. Mm -hmm. And her story deserves to be taught, I think, and learned in our schools. So. Anyway, so back to January, kind of 2017, uh, Senator Warren's trying to read this letter, and her Senate colleagues um, censor her or forcibly silence her and prevent her from reading this letter because they did not agree that it was relevant, and they did not agree that it's always the right time to hear from Credit Scott King. Now, thankfully, Senator Warren immediately left and like kind of read the letter broadcast online, um, but uh, one of her uh, Senate Republican male colleagues I was frustrated by her persistence and said, ah, oh, like we kept telling her she needed to be quiet, yet nevertheless she persisted. And so you know, that really inspired me and I think a lot of women and some men. And I just thought about how many women's stories had inspired me, yes, including my mom um, and including Coretta Scott King. So they're both in the opening gallery scene. So if you open the book, um, they're both there. So even though I don't kind of tell their stories uh, in the later pages of the book, they're very much included because they were very much part of the inspiration for the book. And I also think it's an interesting way to take ownership of words and phrases. And Absolutely. to use them to, to power different things. And to share stories that have inspired me kind of throughout my life. I mean, some of the stories that I write about and she persisted, like from Harriet Tubman or Maria Tallchief, have inspired me since I was a very little girl. And some of them have been more recent inspirations, like Sonia Sotomayor. So also just that we can, and I would argue should find, kind of inspirations uh, throughout our lives, some which we may carry in our hearts always, and some of which may be newer to us, but equally kind of meaningful in helping us find our own resilience and persistence. So Chelsea, we have another phone call. So we're gonna go to that now. Caller, what is your name and what is your question for Ms. Clinton? My name is Jaina and what was your favorite book as a child? Oh, uh, that's a great, that's thank a you great so much. That's a great question. Oh, so it, de it depends on kind of when we're talking about. So when I was um, in first grade, I've already talked about Mrs. Mitchell, we read The Wizard <laughs> of Oz which I just thought was such a magical um, book. And then we later acted it out and I got to be the Wicked Witch of the West, which was so fun because I got to have a, what felt to me at six, very dramatic melting scene. <laughs> um, so I loved that book. Um, as I got a little bit older, I really, really loved A Wrinkle in Time. I mean, that was the first book that I really remember reading that felt kind of empowering to me. Uh, in a way that even though, yes, kind of there's magic in it, felt really relevant to my life here. Because even in The Wizard of Oz, she kind of falls into Oz uh, or gets kind of picked up, I guess, by a storm <laughs> and put into Oz and then kind of finds her way home. But A Wrinkle in Time really said to me, you know, I can kind of take agency and ownership kind of in, in my life, in my um, relationships with my family, my friends, but ho hopefully also my future. So that was a book that I just loved and still love to this day, uh, and it had a big impact on me. Thank you, and thank you for that question. That was great. Fairhill third graders are taking ownership of their own learning in many engaging ways. Let's take a look. Can I get a volunteer to read the reading learning target? Nina? I can brainstorm ideas of how to protect endangered species. Inspired by such books as Don't Let Them Disappear and Start Now, You Can Make a Difference, Fairhill Elementary third graders are taking on the role of a conservationist by identifying real-world problems that impact endangered animals and then working together on a solution. We looked at competition, looked at climate change, and we looked at poaching. Those are the three main things that really have an effect on animals and why they are dying off today. This was self-directed learning. We posed a question. It's the forefront of their learning to where we could educate 
our fellow students and people in the community. Look at the pictures, look at some of the words. What's the big deal about competition? In between animals and humans, humans need more space to like grow more crops and get more space to live in. Awesome. Well, can you tell me about this picture? This picture right here of the polar bear. By the climate, the weather is getting warmer. That polar bear is actually stuck and he's trying to get a way out. Teacher Mark Tioli poses a challenge to his students with this driving question. How can you as a conservationist educate Another word for educate is teach your peers about protecting endangered species. If you recycle, you can save animals from pollution and accidentally eat it. Stop killing animals for lungs. One way to keep uh, pollution from getting into the ocean is to not use as much plastic. Stop cutting down trees. Solving problems and communicating solutions is a multifaceted skill set. These students are up to the task. I think we should pick up trash because maybe it gets in the ocean. And they're taking ownership of their learning. Do not litter. You can use both sides of paper. Okay, how would that help? Instead of just using one side and throwing it away, use both sides so you can use the paper two times. Meaningful learning experiences promote collaboration, communication, and ethical citizenship. Tools that will carry these 21st century students into the future. Wow, conservationists in action. It's awesome. It must be really gratifying to see how your work can inspire so many kids and teachers. It's really inspiring to me. I mean, just even listening to the students talking about, you know, no, like they shouldn't be polluting, not only because it's not good for their kind of local environments, they know that like, you know, a plastic bag can choke a turtle or a it whale, somewhere. like somewhere far around the world. So just that they understand those connections and that I've maybe played a small part in helping them understand those connections. And then they're really inspiring me because they're going out to educate like their friends and classmates, hopefully also their parents, grandparents, um, why it is important to uh, recycle and why it is important to kind of be good citizens locally uh, because that's the right answer locally, but also globally. Well, let's go back to our Fair Hill students and take some more of their questions. So, hi, Fair Hill. Go ahead. We're ready for you. What's your question for Ms. Clinton? Um, my name's Adam, and my question for Ms. Clinton is, where did your love of animals come from? So, Adam, that's a great question. I think it came you know, a little bit from uh, my parents and my grandparents. We had... Um, a dog when I was little, my grandparents had a dog. You know, I had a number of fish when I was little that I had to take uh, care of, and I really did have to take care of them. It was not my parents taking care of them. Um, and so kind of animals were in, in my life, in my kind of grandparents' lives. Um, but I also think it just came from somewhere inside me. I mean, I remember being yeah, probably even younger than you, Adam, and just wanting to know everything I could about elephants. I loved elephants for as long as I can remember. And like what I wanted for Christmas presents and birthday presents was for my like grandparents and parents to help support like elephant conservation efforts around the world because sadly elephants have been under real threat um, for a lot longer than you've been alive and even longer than I've been alive. And so I just felt this deep connection to elephants uh, and a responsibility for elephants. And then out of that grew, I think, a deeper connection and a deeper sense of responsibility to other endangered species. But it really started for me kind of with my, my love of elephants. So Fairhill, do we have another question for Ms. Clinton? Hi, what's your name? Um, my name is Nora. And so is saving endangered animals one of your life goals? Absolutely, oh, yeah. Nora. Saving endangered animals is one of my life goals. I do a lot of work to try to help save elephants. So I work with different organizations to raise awareness you know, here in the United States and around the world about um, the reality, as we've talked about earlier, that ivory only comes from dead elephants, so we should never buy ivory. And I support a full ivory ban. And if you do too, write your uh, local legislators, because it's legal to buy ivory uh, in almost every state in the United States. 
Um, I've done a lot of work to try to help um, equip rangers uh, in places where elephants kind of freely roam across kind of west, central, and uh, eastern and southern Africa so that rangers have the tools they need to help protect and care for elephants and also uh, hopefully to keep poachers out so that the elephants you know, are not being slaughtered for their ivory to try to help um, local groups in countries where there are big elephant populations who are advocating for kind of stronger laws to help protect elephants and stronger penalties against poaching. So uh, I'm doing whatever I can, whenever I can, to try to help uh, save elephants and also to broadly support other conservation efforts because I want you, Nora, and every kid at Farrell and watching and uh, also my kids at home to be able to grow up in a world uh, with elephants uh, and with every kind of species still alive. Uh, but for elephants in particular, if current rates of poaching continue, they will disappear in our lifetime. Uh, so this is a very real threat um, that I'm trying to do everything I can uh, to help stop and hope if you love elephants, you'll join me in this work too. So we have another question from Fairhill. Hi, Fairhill, what's your question for Ms. Clinton? Have you visited any of the habitats of the animals in your book? So I have, so I've been really um, lucky to see elephants in the wild, to see tigers in the wild, to see giraffes in the wild, to see rhinos uh, in the wild. I've never seen whale sharks in the wild, although I hope to at some point. Uh, and I would, it's a, it's a great dream of mine uh, to be able to go to some of the amazing conservation facilities in China to see the giant pandas and to see the work that's being done there to help um, really protect and preserve uh, and continue kind of the slow uh, kind of rebound of the giant panda population in China. So that is really um, high on my bucket list of life to hopefully be able to do at some point. And we have one final question from Fairhill. Hi, what's your name and what is your question? Christopher, and um, how did you learn so much about endangered animals like the penguin? Oh, Christopher, thank you for talking about the pangolins because the pangolins, you know, as I talk about um, in, in Start Now, you know, are the most trafficked animal on earth. They, that means they are the animal that is kind of most illegally brought across national borders because sadly, um, people like to use their scales to make jewelry or handbags or even clothes and their meat is prized as a delicacy. Um, and if current rates of poaching against pangolins continue, we will also lose pangolins you know, very, very soon. So thank you for mentioning them. I learned about kind of these animals in different ways. Some of these animals I've been learning about my whole life. Um, and some of the animals that I heard, kind of Christopher from kids like you, that they really cared about that I didn't know a lot about. I reached out to experts to learn more. So I reached out directly to people who do work with those animals. So including kind of at the Wildlife Conservation Society, which is the organization that oversees all the zoos and aquariums in New York City where I live, but also does a lot of frontline conservation work and just so many others who are really trying to help protect uh, and defend endangered species every day. Uh, because I think if we have questions, we don't know the answer, we should always go directly to the source. Uh, it's a better use of our time, but it also means we're gonna get a, a better answer if we ask the experts directly. And we have time for one more question from Fairhill. Hi, what is your question and what's your name? My name is Asher, and my question is, do you have any advice for aspiring writers? Oh, oh yes. Asher, practice. I mean, I have found, um, I get writer's block. I think every writer does. I mean, maybe some don't, and they're really super <laughs> blessed in that way. But uh, having now uh, talked with and listened to a lot of writers, uh, it seems that we all get writer's block at some point. And yet I have found that practicing, so even if I'm blocked, just sitting down and making myself kind of write words, even if they're uncomfortable and they don't feel like the right words, and I'm like, oh, like that doesn't make a whole lot of sense, and that's a run-on sentence, and oh, I don't know if that's really even like the right word at the beginning or middle and end, and maybe there's not even a beginning, middle and end. I just have found that if I sit down and I make myself write, if I make myself practice, I'm more likely to get to the right words more quickly. I'm more likely to get to the right sentences more quickly, the right paragraphs, and then ultimately to feel um, 
better and hopefully good about what I've written. So I just think practice, practice, practice. Um, I know it's probably what you've heard, but it really is just the best advice uh, that I could give. And it's the advice that I give myself and force myself to take even sometimes uh, when I don't want to, because that's probably when I need it the most. Well, thank you, Fairhill Elementary School, for your questions. It was wonderful having you join us today. Yes, thank you so much, Fairhill. Yeah, bye. Thank you. And thank bye. you, Chelsea. Oh, thank you, Emily. Yeah, thank you so much for chatting with us about your books. It's been a pleasure. Oh, thank you so much for having me. I really enjoyed it. So if you would like to learn more about Chelsea Clinton, follow her on Twitter, at Chelsea Clinton. To learn more about our upcoming programs, visit the Fairfax Network. For the Fairfax Network, I'm Emily Godfrey. Keep reading, keep writing, and keep dreaming. Thanks for watching.